we always do this butterfly effect thing in baseball, especially with the manager. And the reality is, is that once the ball's in play, the manager's kind of irrelevant. Guys got to execute and throw pitches. Defenders got to make plays. The infield's got to play catch with first. Your hitter's got to hit. So, you know, I, I just look at Bruce Bochy, and winning one ring was just, I mean, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Everybody, it was everything. Everybody remembers where they were. Winning two? Winning two? And sweeping the Detroit Tigers? Validated 2010. And, and made it, wow, we're in the middle of something unprecedented. And then to win three. And then to win three in just a short order was something that I just never thought would be possible with the San Francisco Giants. Never were they the number one team in the league. Never did they have the best lineup top to bottom. But they had the greatest maestro in the dugout that this organization's ever seen in Bruce Bochy. And at the end, you know, I think a lot of the media, because of how much everyone loved him, and, and I think a lot of the fans, myself included, we loved him. He could do no wrong. But the reality was is that, you know, like anybody in any profession, you start to slow down a little. The game starts to evolve. And not that you fall behind the times, but you're just a little slower to react. And I think that Dave Roberts, he did a great job kind of, coaching around with the new methods and, and the roster that he had and and the strategy by the Los Angeles Dodgers, it was pretty obvious to me that we were a little behind the times when it comes to innovation, when it comes to the evolution of baseball, um, whether it's the shifts, whether it's the platoons, just the feel. You know, being the manager for 12, 13 years, that's a long run in baseball. It's a long, long run in any profession. So I think the time was right for Bruce Bochy to step down, but I never thought that someone would be able to step right in and make me forget about Bruce Bochy right away. Now, I'll always love him. No one's saying that I'm throwing him out with the bathwater, but Gabe Kapler and what he's done in such a short order has really made me love this guy. He has connected with the community. He's somebody that I look at, and when I see him, I go, damn, he just gets it. He just totally gets it. It feels like he, the players love him. He's very thoughtful. I'm a big believer in being at the cutting edge of industry, whether it's the tech industry, whether it's sales, uh, whether we're talking about construction, any industry, if you're on the cutting edge of thought, you're going to be ahead of the curve. Now, you're not always going to be right. Sometimes your product comes out a little quicker than, than everyone else, but I, I just love where the Giants are at with Gabe Kapler, and I feel like last year... He really blended the feel of baseball, the instincts. The, that was the best part of Bruce Bochy. The instincts, you know, the gut, the old school baseball scout with all of what I call the spreadsheet data, even though nobody even prints out spreadsheets. So we got Gabe Kapler going to join us in about three minutes. Gabe Kapler, your manager of the San Francisco Giants. And I'm just, I'm so fascinated to talk to this guy because I, I'm, I'm a big fan, number one. And number two, I feel like we are seeing the beginnings of what could be a really great career. 6.15, Joe. 6.15. I'm, I'm because 6.15 is very early in the morning. I don't know how many managers would be willing to call <laughs> in at this time. I have zero doubt in my mind that Gabe Kapler is just getting done with his morning workout uh -huh. right now. Just got done it because he's the type of guy that would have a schedule for that sort of thing. You know, like Mark Wahlberg, he had a, a whole schedule for wake up, shower, eat, all do all these different things, work. I'm sure Gabe Kapler has the same type of thing because you don't get those bulging oh veins God. in the closing ceremony of the baseball game in the middle of the sun without having a schedule. So I think really we're we're going to be 15 minutes post workout here for Gabe Kapler. Really I'm, looking forward. I'm to all it, about it. I'm all about it. And and you know I, I keep bringing up Boach because. I feel like the 49ers have kind of gone through the same thing with Bill Walsh, trying to step out from the Bill Walsh shadow, trying to step out from the Joe Montana, Steve Young shadow for a quarterback feels nearly impossible. Well, the, the thing the thing with Gabe Kapler in the first season, though, was, and this is what Bruce Bochy was mm -hmm. the king of, which was the bullpen moves. And the bullpen moves with Trevor Gott mm -hmm. and those guys that he was making moves with, that yeah. Angels game, that was terrible. Yeah. Uh, but... What did he have to work with? Not a lot. He only had so much in his bullpen, but fans were blaming him. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, he's never going to be the same as Bochi when it comes to the bullpen changes. Well, this is already a failure. But then in this 
next Time era, he has more players to work with. He's got Camilo Duvall coming up. He's got Logan Webb, who's turned into an ace of this yeah. staff. So he finally had something well, to work with, and he delivered. So well, I think he won fans over last season. There's no doubt. And, you know, I'll take it a step further. He's going to join us any minute now. Gabe Kapler, New York manager of San Francisco Giants. I had an opportunity to meet Alyssa Nackin. She's the first female coach for the San Francisco Giants. And just what an incredible person. I, I got a, a chance for a luncheon. I got to meet her. And she described while she was up at the stage um, doing this luncheon, and she was saying, you know, I wanted to be involved in the baseball operations, the day-to-day part. She was doing stuff on the kind of the front office side, and she wanted to be a part of the staff. And Gabe gave her a call, and I hope I'm not giving away too much. She told it at a public setting. So she gave him a call, and they went out for a walk out at Ocean Beach, and they just talked about baseball, and they just went out talking, and I just, the art of the conversation and the feel in this social media era where everybody's behind a keyboard, I think that we've lost that art of of feel and touch, and when I hear and see Gabe Kapler on my television, I I see someone that kind of understands, and this is the quality Bruce Bochy had as well, there's a human element to all of this. As much as the data matters, connecting on a personal level, I think truly matters in sports still to this day. I remember last year when you guys interviewed Kai Correa and you asked him what type of changes that they've yeah. made within their practice method and he gave a 3 minute and 43 <laughs> it was incredible. It was a 3 minute 43 second answer. I remember yeah. it on the dot, on the dot. But each method he said, "Well, there's three different changes that we've made." And he went on for a minute yeah. each. But it feels like when he was talking about that, Kapler as well as the rest of the staff have brought more motivation back into the game for the guys like Brandon Crawford. I think that's why he had such a good season yeah. last year is they, they gave him a re- rejuvenation, I guess, as mm-hmm. you'd say. Plus it was a contract here, so it's like, you know, we're gonna get a we're gonna yeah. sign him for a new deal. But uh I think that they just changed everything, at least within the locker room, yes. how they approached things, and it was uh, it was a tough transition in the first year, but it was seamless in the second year by the time he got his coaching staff shaped out. I, I, I really like Gabe Kapler as a coach for the Giants. You know, I, I do too. I do too. And, and time's going to tell, you know, what they end up being in terms of just the roster construction over time. But just look at what they did last year. And and I know it's a one season, but it, it was a huge season. It was a monumental season for a new front office. Brian Sabian and Bobby Evans and what they've done with this organization, changing it night and day. I mean, we went from the have-nots my entire life to a team with a gem ballpark and became the haves. One of the top five payrolls in baseball, years after year after year. Now, at the end, eh, the, the, the contracts were bloated. But they're trying to reset this thing on the fly. And just think of the career years that were had last year. Jake McGee, Tyler Rogers, Camilo Duvall, even though it was a short stint. Crawford, Belt. Uh, the, I mean, we talked about Donovan Solano the year before. Yastrzemski the year before that. So many people had career years last year. It's incredible. Now let's get to him. All right, we've got him. We let, and I want to start here. We got your San Francisco manager, Gabe Kapler. And Gabe, before I get to the team and before I get to, you know, all of the different variables for this year and things that you've gone through in the past, I want to start with the community thing. I'm riding my car down in Barcadero last year, and you might not remember this. I look in my side mirror and I go, man, there's a guy riding a bicycle pretty aggressively alongside of me on Embarcadero near AT&T Park. And I look over and it's you, coach, and you got the jeans on with the ripped jeans and you're on the bicycle and your jacked muscles and I rolled the window down and I said what's up coach and you turned and gave me the wave and I said to myself my god I can't think of a guy who's better assimilated to this community the way you have what is it about San Francisco that you feel so connected to because I really truly feel like you've embraced this community you've gone to warrior games I'm seeing you you know in the front row you're dapping it up with my boy Bonte what is it about San Francisco that makes you feel so connected well, I appreciate it, first of all. Some nice compliments mixed in there, and that's really nice to hear. Um, I guess I feel like I'm at home in San Francisco. It's the easiest way to put it. I felt like I have been accepted and appreciated for some of the, the ways that I'm different in San Francisco, which is, which is really helpful, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, if everybody wanted me to come in and be exactly like Bruce Bochy, that would be a really tough challenge. He's a legendary manager, has had so much success in San Francisco and so beloved by the fans. But we're different people, so it would be very difficult if if people were trying to recreate that because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different. And all I've felt from San Francisco is is appreciation, respect, and, and support. 
it's not to say there haven't been some bumps in the road, then there won't there won't be bumps in the road going forward. But I certainly have felt embraced and accepted. You know, Coach, you bring up Bruce Bochy, and I, I kind of opened the show talking about the shadow that he cast. I mean, he's the greatest manager in, in San Francisco Giants history, and I love that you don't really skirt that. You you kind of attack it head on, and, and you recognize that. And I, this isn't a Bruce Bochy question, but more a baseball question. As a fan of baseball and knowing the history of the Giants, how cool was it? I mean, I know we lost. How cool was it that you guys got the Dodgers in the playoffs last year? I mean, I, it was game five. I'm sitting there with my wife, Buster Posey versus Kenley Jansen in the bottom of the eighth inning. I mean, I know we fell short, but just as a fan of baseball and knowing the history of this team, that was pretty special. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you brought up those two guys, right? Because, you know, Jansen's never going to be, well, he's not in the Dodgers uniform, and Buster's not going to be wearing a Giants uniform. So, it really does exemplify um, the, the rivalry to some degree or another, and I think it, it probably is a healthy reminder that we want to appreciate things while we have them. And getting back to your original qu- question, um, we wouldn't have it any other way. We want to play, we want to be able to beat the best, and obviously we fell a little short last year, and um, it provides a lot of fuel uh, and motivation to be a better team, and the way we become a better team is through improving our processes and our practices and that's what spring training is for. That's why we're here and what we're doing right now. Yeah, that's such a great point. We got Gabe Kapler, manager of San Francisco Giants, on with us right now. And you bring up Buster Posey. I mean, look, he's a legend. There's no other way around it. I'm wearing a, a legend Buster Posey sweatshirt right now. How do you fill the void uh, of his of his leadership? It feels like that's just such a tough thing to try to quantify. How do you guys go about filling that void of Buster Posey's loss? Well, you don't fill it with one individual, right? It's like um, a lot of people have asked me that question, and for good reason. But there's no Joey Bart come. Excuse me. There's no Buster Posey coming in the form of Joey Bart or any other catcher that we have in our system. And there's no Buster Posey coming in free agency because that player doesn't exist. <laughs> He's a unique individual who had a, a well-rounded game and, and contributed in so many different ways. So I think what you try to do instead is help Joey and Kirk Casale be the best versions of themselves, turn their games up marginally, and then go all the way across the field and at every position and try to make everyone else better through player development at the major league level and then fill some voids in other ways in spring training, or excuse me, in, in free agency and then subsequently in spring training and during the season. So Carlos Rodon is a good example of that. You get you get better in your starting rotation mm. instead of trying to get better, you know, at one specific position because it's just not going to be as good as it was. And um, Joey's exceptionally talented. Kurt is a winner and an excellent major league catcher. But but Buster Posey is is irreplaceable, and we know that. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And and just like you replacing Bruce Bochy, you know, Joey Bart's kind of been the, the heir apparent to Buster Posey. That must be really hard on the kid. I mean, that's almost impossible to try to do. Have you ever had any conversations with him on just being himself, kind of like how you have replaced Bruce Bochy, just being yourself? I, I don't think you have to have that conversation with Joey as it relates to, to Buster because, you know, he really knows it. And, and Joey has plenty to work on. So I don't think you have to use that as motivation or, or create the correlation in any way. Rather, I think mm. you talk to Joey about how he can improve his relationships with pitchers, which he has, how he can improve his, his game calling and his prep, which he has, his blocking and receiving, his, his, his framing, his throwing, his leadership in the clubhouse, his own uh, ability to manage it at bat and, and – look over the baseball, look for pitches to drive and, and lay off the pitches that he can't. Like there's so much there's so much for him to work on that I just don't think it's necessary, you know, to bring in the oh yeah, and by the way, be yourself. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I get your I, I get your point. Yeah, a lot to think about right now. Yeah, no doubt about it. And you know, Gabe, I had an opportunity to to talk with Alyssa Knack, and I was so impressed with her. And she explained a story about how you and her went on a walk when when you first hired her, and you guys were out near Ocean Beach, and it was so relatable because I've walked that that little trail so many times with my family. And I guess where I'm going at this is the personal touch, the personal element. Um, and I, I just look at uh, at what you've done with these veterans, and and I was reluctant because I heard so many.
many things from the Philadelphia media about how you're all about the data, and I and I, I could not be farther from the truth. You you replace Brandon Crawford game one, everybody's losing their minds in 2020, and a year and a half later, it feels like you got all those guys behind your back, and and you've got their back. What goes into your relationship with some of the veterans on this team, like Belt and Crawford? Well, I appreciate it that it's it's viewed as as personal touch, but what I found. Um, over the years, this is true in Philadelphia. It's also true in San Francisco. It was true when I was working for another team, and when you know when I was a player myself in the clubhouse. Honesty and directness is the love language of players. Like people just want to be shot straight, told the truth, not bullshitted, and um, sometimes that's hard, and sometimes. Like in, in 2020, it, it wasn't easy for people to, to hear when it you know, was related to a guy like Craw, who has since proved, proved me, you know, some, somebody that, that needed to open their eyes and see how great of a baseball player he still is through his work and how, you know, impactful he can be for, for a major league team. I mean, he's, a, you know, an MVP candidate last year, never wanted to take him out of lineup and you know frankly don't have any plans of, of doing anything but sticking him in there as much as he's capable of playing in in 2022 and he knows that so the relationship development for me comes through um first of all having time like spending time mm-hmm. with, with players and with staff and second with with being direct and honest and and i think that that solves many of the the issues that players and management and coaches tend to have in, in, in Major League Baseball and across professional sports. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And the self-inflection and, and, and reflection, excuse me, of uh, of knowing where you're at, the self-awareness. I, I love that I feel like I've seen a different version, not of Brandon Crawford because he's always been very relaxed and calm and happy-go-lucky, but Brandon Belt, I mean, he seems to be really coming out of his shell. What happened there? Is it just him being more mature? Is it him feeling more comfortable? Why is he so open with his personality personality these days i think he feels appreciated for who he is right that's that's when you see uh this is human this is not baseball but but when people when people are comfortable in their own skin they're comfortable with who they are and they feel appreciated you see the best in them and you see the the lightness and the playfulness come out and brandon can be a serious dude but he's at his best when he's kind of um he's either being self-deprecating or or he's just kind of being silly with like stuff like the captain bit, and he's he's just he's just him. He's he's got a great sense of humor. It, players really gravitate towards him, and he's got a great way of preparing for the baseball game. Yeah, the, the way he does. It's not like it's not a show you how hard he's working. It's preparing in a smart way, conserving energy, but always being ready when he steps into the batter's box or on the dirt around the bag. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what do you think the strategy is for him this year in terms of trying to get a full season out of him? Are you guys going to utilize that DH a little more with him or just kind of, you know, status quo like you did last year? Gabe, are you there? So, yeah, I am. You Sorry, you broke up for just a second. Oh. But my, my, my thought load management for Brandon and how to keep him at his sharpest and healthiest. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Basically, you know, I, I want to see him have a full season. You know, the fences are finally in. It felt like your guys' strategy with him in terms of his appro- approach at the plate. Everything clicked last year. And I just, God, I want to see him play 120 games this year and have that monster full season that we all know he has in him. Yeah, I mean, you could make a strong case that if he played, he played a full season, just kind of, you know, pushed his numbers out across – you know, 600 plate appearances that it would have been a historically good hmm. season for Brandon Bell. So um, we want to see it as well. Load management is, is definitely a thing. One of the things that just kind of plays into our favor with the DH, I don't think has been talked about quite enough, is that we're not going to have to p- to hit for the pitcher spot, right? Yeah. So we are going to have more options to hit in the spot of a position player in a, in a pinch hit scenario. And it might not be quite as necessary as it was to hit for the pitcher. So by way of example, let's say Brandon Belt is getting a day off. And let's say Darren Ruff is playing first base on that day or Wilmer Flores. You're not as desperate to get Brandon Belt ready to pinch hit in that situation for the first baseman, right? Because you've got 
a really good option in Wilmer Flores or, or Darren Ruff, and you can afford and to comfortably give Brandon Belt a full day off, which I think you know gives him an opportunity to be healthier and fresher on the days that he is in the lineup. So not to say that's going to solve everything because you know injury prevention is and I think will always be a bit of a black box. Mm. You do the best you can, but you really don't know what the perfect workload is. We're tracking and logging as much as we possibly can. But this is, this is my responsibility, the responsibility of our medical staff. And to be, and to be honest, collaboration yeah. with our players to really listen to how they're doing so that we can get them on the field as much as possible at their best. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. we got Gabe Kapler, manager of the San Francisco Giants, on. Just a couple of more minutes with him. Gabe, you, you brought up kind of the data, and I think too much has been made of you guys utilizing the data. How do you guys go about, what, what does it look like in the dugout in terms of blending all the data that you guys are compiling with the gut, with the intuition, the old school? Because I know you're a ball player at heart. I mean, that's you look like you're ready to grab a bat and go up there and hit. My dad loves you, you know what I mean? I, you're sitting there ready to, ready to jump out of the dugout, you know, and it makes me super excited because you're totally aware at all times, but how do you guys blend the data with the instincts, and then what do those conversations look like in the dugout? I think the best way, uh, the best anecdote to, to talk about is when we're, when we're dealing with the starting pitcher, and we set out with, hey, like, we know that this, this pitcher's velocity tends to decline um, at 80 pitches, right? Mm-hmm. So somewhere in the vicinity, 75 to 80 pitches. And, you know, sometimes a lack of velocity is, is correlated with some success for the other team. Or if the data tells us that his command drops off somewhere, you know, in his fifth up, like he's up for the fifth time and back out there on the field. So the data and the, the, the on-paper analysis is that you might want to remove that pitcher from the game at that point. But this is where watching the game, you know, comes into play. Like you're seeing not just the velocities kind of stay steady, but maybe he's, he's continuing to attack the strike zone. He's continuing to work fast. When you look at him in the dugout, you look at the pitcher, you see really good eyes. The eyes are aware and they're, they're bright and it's not too, um, it's not too emotional and it's not too anxious. And then we're having conversations with the pitcher about how he's doing, how he's feeling and, and you get it, bringing in some context. Well, what was it like the last time you went seven innings? Or you know, are you feeling similar to that time? Are we are we seeing the arm slot drop? Mm. What's Bale saying? Our pitching coach, like, you know, what's his read on the on the situation? Anybody else in the dugout that can add some add some opinion here? Like Ron Wotus around? He's seen a lot of dudes go out there and you know run out of gas or or stay strong through another innings. Hey, hey, whoa, what do you think? Right, so. Yeah. At the end of the day, we've, we've taken all of that information, and none of that is on paper analysis. And then we blend it all together and make the best decision for the Giants. And that's really the way all of our decisions are made. Yeah, I mean, uh, co- it, it's, Coach, the proof's in the no, pudding. It, I promise you that. It, so Coach, again, the proof is in the pudding. Apologies for running you off there, but, like, you guys hit more pinch hit home runs than anyone ever. I mean, it was incredible. Right, and, and some of that, to be honest with you, some of that is data, right? You're – if you're pinch hitting for Lamont Wade Jr., there's a left-handed pitcher coming in at the Oakland Coliseum. That left-handed pitcher has historically carved up Lamont Wade Jr. or, or Lamont Wade Jr. has struggled against lefties so far. And you got Donovan Solano sitting there, and Donovan is a uh, you know he's a, a, a righty masher of left-handed pitching. It's part of the reason he's on the roster. There's some data there, but it's also the the conversation with Donovan and knowing that. He's prepared for that moment, and he's going to come up and put a good swing on the ball. doesn't mean he's going to go deep, but the chances of him having a high quality at bat in that situation are good. Yeah. So I appreciate the, the call out on the, on the pinch hit. So there's, there is some information that, that leads to those those decisions. I mean, Lamont Wade Jr. coming in, it was just incredible in the ninth inning last year. we got Gabe Cap. A couple more quick questions before you get on out of here. You talked about, you know, different pitching changes and you guys going out there. And I mean, think about Tyler Rogers, Camilo Duvall's in-season development, the way you use Jake McGee and just the rest of the bullpen was absolutely spectacular. But I don't want to get into the bullpen. I want to talk about what I see when you're going out to the mound. Coach, your shoe game is on point. I mean, on point. I don't know what shoes you were wearing the other day. They look like some Chuck Taylor high tops, but they were super fancy. I've seen you rock the Donovan Mitchells. What's up with the shoe game, man? Are you a, you a, you a sneakerhead? 
Uh, you know what? I was hoping we'd get to this question because I, I don't. I don't feel like an, an interview is complete unless we're talking about shoes. Let's go. We should also uh, set aside some time at some point to talk about boots away from the field. <laughs> but on the field, on the field, I, 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 I. There's not a lot of other areas to express yourself, right? When you're wearing a uniform, you don't have a choice, right? You're yeah. Not, you, you can wear a watch, which I like watches too. But the other place you can actually create a little individuality and do your thing is is at the shoes. So I like shoes, and uh, I always have. And um, I don't I don't think we're married to traditional like baseball turf, which I think are fine. And, and a lot of coaches have worn them over the years. But our entire coaching staff is kind of shoe game heavy, and <laughs> we we'll, you know we'll go back and forth. I wear Adidas, and so me too. Um, along with Adidas, we have we have Yeezys and we have Y threes to choose from. But like Bales is is a Jordan guy. So, you know, Kai Correa is, is more of a, a Nike guy. Fernando Perez oh. has the sickest New Balance, um, and I think they come from Longoria. So we're always talking about shoes in the clubhouse. Uh, our players have, have pretty good shoe game as well, and I think it's just a fun way to, to step outside of, of the traditional uniforms because we don't, she don't have a choice. We're going to be wearing Giants uniforms, and we're proud of that, but – a good place to kind of express yourself. Coach, let me tell you, the Bay is straight swagged out. So when we see our coach, our manager walking out there, and he's rocking Yeezys or the Donovan Mitchell, the Spiders, the Don ones, or whatever they're called. I mean, it's just it's a fly look. But I'll be real with you, your guns on the arms. I mean, they're popping. You've been skipping leg day though, bro. Uh, I I appreciate that. You I do have skinny legs, always have. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. It's not. It's not for a lack of work. <laughs> uh, a couple quick more questions before we get on here. I want to ask you about Logan Webb, but before we get to that guy, what about the Dodgers, man? I mean, is that was an epic series last year? I mean, Posey hitting the home run in Game One. Like you guys fought tooth and nail. Their guys made a couple of extra plays. Bellinger came through in the clutch. I, I'm not mad. It was. I was disappointed and sad and heartbroken. We lost. I'm sure you guys ten times more than I ever will be. But it. I was so proud. I was just so proud of the team and everything. And then. Then you got Dave Roberts coming out and and saying that he thinks that they they can win the World Series. Now he was kind of backed into into a corner there. But when when you heard the quote on the Dan Patrick show from Dave Roberts, what did Gabe Kapler think? What makes you think I heard the quote? Oh, you haven't heard it. Uh, well, I'm he, not saying I'm anyway, but you're making an assumption that I have. Oh, my bad. He basically said that it, he he thinks they can win the World Series this year and that they should win the World Series this year. No, no, I, I was being playful. <laughs> <laughs> you scared me, coach. I thought I went one step too far. No, no, you're you're good. I was just having some fun with you. We were we were we were on a roll. With- <laughs> I wanted to stay with it, but sometimes sometimes it doesn't come off the way I meant. Anyhow, no, you're good. Yeah, taking a step back. I like uh, the way I think about it is we have control over certain things, right? We have control over our processes. We have control over our practices. And we always want to be fine-tuning those, always trying to make those just a little bit better. So yeah. we do that every day in spring training. We also do it during the season. So if you ask me what the goal of the San Francisco Giants is right now, it's to improve our processes and practices and trust that that's going to lead to the best possible outcome in 2022, whether that means like going deeper into the postseason, which is you know one of our goals always, but more importantly, if you're, if you're Brandon Crawford, setting the goal of winning the MVP after coming off a season where you were in the MVP conversation is probably not as effective as saying, my work is going to improve. I'm going to recover better. Yeah. I'm going to take the steps that lead to success. And that's how we think about it. It's not that we don't want to win the World Series. It's not that we don't want to win the National League West. It's not that we, want, we don't want to win 108 games. It's that we have make, making that an improvement on last year. It's that we have small steps to take that are way more important and are going to require a lot of attention and energy. Yeah. So that's how we think about, like, what are our goals for, for 2022. Okay, so Giants World Series on deck. All right. Well, I'm going to take it when I'm just teasing. Uh, Coach, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the fences being brought in last year, and, and there's so much about data because I listened to Farhan talk about, um, you know, what went into to changing the field. you got to understand, AT&T was like a church. You know, I, I never thought that they would switch the dimensions up. And the way they did it actually was beautiful. It, it doesn't ruin the integrity of the ballpark at all. Did you guys get the impact in terms of hitting production while still 
still being a pitcher's park that you were looking for, you know, going into kind of moving those fences? Um, I don't think that that was necessarily the goal, but I, but I hear you. I think our players benefited, particularly our veteran players, hmm. who in years past have seen balls die at the fence that went out of the ballpark. They gave them some additional, uh, additional confidence. And as you know, there's nothing that's more important than confidence in the batter's box. Now, that being said, our, our ballpark is still not any sort of like band box. It's not no. Coors Field. Not, it's not Arizona. It's still, uh, in, in my mind, and, and I'm not, I don't have data in front of me, but it's still a pitcher's park, yeah. which is why we have pitchers who are excited about coming to work with our pitching coaches and pitch in a, in a at least neutral park uh, in Oracle. So, feel good about that and feel good about the way our hitters are feeling about themselves right now. Yeah, you know, a couple quick work more. we got Gabe Cabot with us, manager. Uh, the bullpen was outstanding last year. you got the guy throwing basically submarine style and Tyler Rogers, who was outstanding. And then you throw in the lefty, throwing fastballs at different eye spots on the on the chart and, and McGee. And you got a whole bunch of other guys that you went with. But the way that you guys trusted the kid, Camilo Duvall, and he comes out just flame-throwing. And the development within the season... From what we saw at the beginning, I believe in May when he came up, to where he was September, and even trying to close games out, it was just fantastic. What's the bullpen looking like now? Is it closer by committee, or are you going to hand that ball to the kid and say, go get me 40 saves this year? One of the things that we've always said about roles in the bullpen, and, and this has got to be my last question, brother. Yeah, no problem. I get it. No, thank you for spending this much time with us. Uh, no, no, happy, happy to do it. Uh, is that the guys take control of roles? Like, we don't have to. We don't have to hand them out. We don't have to prescript them. They they say this is mine and I'm going to take it right. And so last year we got saves from Camilo, as you mentioned. We got saves from Jake McGee. We got saves from Tyler Rogers. All three of them and others uh, are capable of taking down the ninth inning. Guys like to have roles, and we're always looking to put them in those those comfortable ones. But it's really uh, determined on the field, and they like it that way. Particularly this group. Jake and Raj, Camilo, these guys all want to earn it. And look, those guys are all going to probably get opportunities at the ninth inning. We'll probably settle in with, with one person when somebody emerges as the dude, um, as we have in the past, as we did with Jake last year, and then Camilo towards the end. So uh, I just don't feel like we have to script it. Okay. These guys can take control of it, and when they take control of it, we're going to give it to them. I love it. All right, Gabe Kapler, thank you so much for joining us. April 8th, opening day against the Marlins. I'm fired up. Logan Webb on the hill. Thank you so much for spending the time with us, Coach Cap, and uh, I look forward to seeing what shoes you're rocking on opening day. I can't wait. Thanks for the time. We'll talk to you soon. I love it. Gabe Kapler, your manager, San Francisco Giants. I hope we got everything we needed out of him. I wanted to ask him a Logan Webb question. I just kept spinning the yarn. And by the way, yeah, no lie. Your boy was was a little scared when he said I did not hear it. I, I backed off. I thought he was gonna, you know, suplex me through the phone.